Elon Musk, the tech entrepreneur, is known for his ambitious projects, from Tesla electric cars to SpaceX's mission to colonize Mars. But here's the fascinating thing. Musk isn't known for the small, incremental steps. He's known for what, he's, what he calls first principles thinking. This involves breaking down complex concepts and problems to their most basic, fundamental truths, and then building them up from there. Elon Musk didn't just appear on the scene to build electric cars or to launch rockets. He began by identifying a purpose greater than himself. He needed, that we needed a sustainable source of energy on the earth, but then he also wanted to get humans on multi-planetary habitation. Every labor, every task, every problem he solves, every project he undertakes, it contributes to his larger vision. His why informs the what and how. Similarly, as followers of Jesus, we also have a greater purpose. Our why, so to speak, is to labor for the kingdom of God. As Paul said in Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work in you will see it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. We all have had, or we currently have, our day jobs, be it doctors, teachers, engineers, office workers, factory personnel, musicians, caretakers, or whatever, even stay-at-home moms, whatever your gig might be. We labor, often tirelessly, to provide, to create, to heal, and to help. But there's another job that we all are appointed to, no matter what our earthly occupation is, to labor in God's kingdom. So today, as we discuss laboring for God's kingdom and the work that he does in us and through us, we're going back to the first principles. We're going to look at the foundational truths that Jesus has laid himself. We're going to look at what it means to build a life and a community of faith that not only aims for the stars, but is built to withstand the challenges and the storms of this life. Pray with me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we invite your presence here to ravage us, open our minds, soften our hearts, help us to receive what your word is today. Be our teacher and be our guide. Be our healer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please open your Bibles or your Bible app to Philippians chapter 1. And as you do so, now's the time. Please stand with me in reverence for reading God's scripture. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians is a little bit about three, a little bit past three fourths of the way through your Bible, or it's near the center of the New Testament. So, Philippians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 7. Here, Paul is saying to the church at Philippi, I give thanks to my God. And if your translation is a little different than mine, that's okay. I'm having the CSB version. I give thanks to my God for my, remember, my every remembrance of you, always praying for joy for all of you in ev my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he, meaning Jesus, who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion, to maturity, to perfection until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can have a seat. The work God started in us is not just a one-time event when we decided to start believing in him or whenever we professed Jesus as Lord or maybe when we were baptized. Paul said that this work that God started in us is an ongoing process. It's a labor of love over our lifetime. Jesus proclaimed himself as the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't just mean this rhetorically. He laid that as his 
a blueprint. In Matthew chapters 5 through 7, he delivered his manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount. And this details how a citizen of the kingdom of heaven ought to live. Over our lifetime, as God continues to work in us and through us, we are continually, as long as we are continually surrendered to him, this sermon that Jesus shared is literally what he teaches and what it means to follow him. So how do we do this in different professions or contexts of life? And I'm going to give you a a couple examples here to consider. Teachers. You shape young minds. As you do, remember Jesus' teachings on humility, kindness, and patience. Just as Jesus taught his disciples, you have the power to influence the next generation in righteousness. Healthcare workers, you are the healers, often standing on the brink of life and death and holding that in balance. Remember Jesus' acts of healing, sacrifice, and how he never turned anyone away, even and especially those who society rejects. Warehouse workers, you are the backbone of commerce, ensuring the flow of goods and resources. Recall Jesus' teachings about integrity and work in Matthew 5.16. As you organize, stock, and distribute, do so with the same diligence and integrity honesty that Jesus embodied. Office workers, in the midst of paperwork, emails, and endless meetings, remember that Jesus' commitment to service and community. Just as he reached out to listen, advise, and just be present in people's lives, make your office space a place of collaboration, understanding, and reflect the values of honor love, and respect. Data technicians and financial gurus. I'm up here because that's not me. (laughs) In a world driven by data and numbers and information, you help translate those numbers into meaning. I don't know how you do it, but thank you for doing it. Let Jesus' teaching about wisdom and discernment guide your analysts to help you steward wisely. Just as Jesus interpreted the scriptures for his disciples and his followers, may you illuminate God's truths with clarity and purpose. Stay-at-home moms, you nurture and guide. You create a foundation of love and understanding within the walls of your home. Jesus cherished a family. He called children to come to him. He set them on his lap, and he loved them. Jesus also uplifted the roles of women. Your work is sacred. Remember his teachings on unconditional love and patience. And as you raise the next generation, you're doing that in righteousness. Retired people. So if I didn't check the box yet, now it's time. You spent years contributing to society in various ways, and now it's your time to reflect. You have new pursuits ahead of you. You also have time and opportunity to apprentice others. Jesus' teachings on wisdom and the value of a well-lived life are your guideposts. Whether you mentor the young, or you volunteer, or you simply have a season of desperately needed rest, and that's okay. You earned it. Continue to serve as a model of a lifelong learning, faithfulness, and making disciples. So what about the church? After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit was poured out on his disciples at Pentecost, 50 days after he resurrected. And the disciples continued to labor in the way of Jesus. They healed, they taught, they served, and they loved. Jesus modeled that to them. And what he modeled, they demonstrated during their lifetime in accordance with how he taught them to live in the kingdom. Paul reiterates that. In Philippians 1, jumping down to verse 27, he said, Just one thing. 
as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit. Say one spirit. In one accord. Say one accord. Contending together for the faith in the gospel, of the gospel. Contending together. Let's say that. Contending together. That means laboring together as one for the same purpose, for the gospel. This isn't just Paul's wish. This is God's design for us. So if we're truly going to be followers of Jesus and be laborers in God's kingdom, then we must go beyond just doing tasks or fulfilling duties. That's a religion. We must make it our lifestyle. Let's call it living the Jesus way. Here are some examples of living the Jesus way directly from the Sermon on the Mount. Number one, the Beatitudes as a lifestyle. There are eight of these. One of the foundational elements, the first principles in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, you, you see are the Beatitudes. These aren't merely suggestions. They are transformative attributes of how to live in God's kingdom. They reflect God in the kingdom. Application. So how do we practice humility and peacemaking in our workplaces and our homes? How do we practice having a hunger for righteousness in our daily interactions? This week, here's my challenge for you. Read Matthew chapter 5, 3 through, two, 3 through 12, and identify just one of those eight Beatitudes and see how you could implement it into your daily life to live the Jesus way. Number two, salt and light. Jesus called us to be the salt of the world, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. These aren't part time roles, they're our full time gig. We overlay them on top of everything else we're doing. And these elements ought to define our very existence as a Jesus follower, living the Jesus way every day. Application. Think of ways you can be salt and light in your sphere of influence. Maybe it's offering a kind word, a smile. Maybe giving somebody your parking spot. <gasps> I can't do that. What if you did? Or maybe you are just aware because you're looking for it, a way for you to help somebody who you see is in need. And it may cause you to go out of your way, but that's all right. Make it a point to show the love of Christ every day. That's living the Jesus way. Number three, the Lord's Prayer. I think we all know that or have said that, probably heard it for sure. Prayer wasn't meant to be a ritual, but a relationship. The Lord's Prayer teaches us how to align ourselves with God's will, a lifestyle of continual communication and daily surrender. Application. Rather than just praying because of your own needs, because something comes up and you need something and you check off the box, instead, aim to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer where we regularly seek God's will and offer our lives as a living sacrifice every day. Live the Jesus way. Join us on Wednesdays for the Power Prayer Hour and deepen your relationship with God. Number four, the golden rule. Do you guys know the golden rule? If you do, call it out. The golden rule is what? Yes, Jesus said, so in everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He didn't say, if you don't want someone to lie to you, don't lie to them. If you don't want someone to treat you badly, then don't treat them badly. What did he say? He said, do unto others. Do. Be intentional. You might have somebody who's a curmudgeon in your life. Don't treat them in kind, but instead, how you would want them to treat you. Do to them. Treat them nicely. If somebody's negative, don't treat them badly or negative, but instead, treat them positively, with love, with honor, because that's how you want to be treated. So how you want to be treated, Jesus is saying, do that to others.
So the application is Jesus intended the golden rule to be a lifestyle. Make it a lifestyle, not just a quote you like. This is at the core of what it means to live the Jesus way. Number five, laboring together. And we're going to circle back to where we all started in Philippians chapter 1. This is essential because Paul, remember, Paul was not talking to individuals. He was talking to a community, a community of believers. And that's the application. Living the Jesus way is not about my walk with God. Living the Jesus way is about our walk with God and also with each other. Share your struggles and victories with a fellow follower of Jesus this week. Be vulnerable with them. It's okay. Encourage each other together to continue laboring for the kingdom so that you can live the Jesus way together. That's the church. The church is community living the Jesus way. So as we conclude, I'm going to dive, let's just dive a little bit deeper, just a little deeper into the Jesus way. We have so many ways thrown at us throughout our lives. Our parents tell us the way that they want us to live, right? School tells us how they want us to live. Then there's the government and society telling us the way that they want us to do things. Then we have our boss in our careers telling us the way that we're supposed to do things. And if you are married, then you have a spouse who tells you how to do things. And guys, you better listen. And then we have our kids who tell us how they want us to do things. And then we have religions who tell us that they have the way. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker, Coexist? You seen that? This sticker alone denotes various ways of living. It points to an ecosystem of an incubated worldview, meaning each of these is its own way of thinking. It's its own box. You don't think outside that box, though. Don't, don't dare think outside that box. Because when you think inside that box, you're thinking on their way of how to do things. You're supposed to follow their way of thinking. When you think outside the box, feathers get ruffled. Ooh. Guys, Jesus operated outside the box. Did you know that? His way of doing things was different than these other ways. They don't want you to believe that, though. They want you to believe that their way is a way and the way. Some of them parallel so closely that you almost cannot distinguish from one way or the other. But they are not the way, all capital letters, the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if Jesus is the way, all capital letters, then logically, by default, these other ways are not it. Really, though, think about that. Many of these other ways recognize Jesus. They point to Jesus. They say that he is a way. They say that he's one of the ways. They say that, he, that, their, that their way is going to lead to him or they coincide with him. Yet, out of his own mouth, he said that he is the way. In our society, everyone's wanting to go their own way. They want to do what's truth to them. They want to follow their heart. Well, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful among all else. Who can understand it? Our hearts do not lead us to the right way. Do not follow your heart. You won't be doing the Jesus way. Don't follow another way. Jesus said, I am the way. If Jesus is the way, why follow any other way? Right? If you are truly trying to have a relationship with God, Jesus is the way. Get rid of every other way. 
get rid of it. C.S. Lewis wrote an amazing book called Mere Christianity. I, I invite you all to read that. You could probably get it for free at the library or on, the, on an app. You could even listen to it on YouTube. Somebody's reading it. It's free. We have it probably in the church office, Priscilla, right? Yes, we do. She's shaking her head. Mere Christianity. Dwindle it, everything else away. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to have a relationship with God? Do you want to have a relationship with God for the rest of your life so that in eternity you're going to be with him having a relationship? If you do and you answered yes to that, then Jesus is your way. He said it. I'm just repeating it. Follow Jesus. Follow the Jesus way. Don't follow any other way because this is God's design for us. Jesus wasn't here to coexist. If you're confused, I'm going to clarify it for you. Jesus wasn't here to coexist. He was here to ruffle feathers. And what I'm about to read are his own words from Matthew chapter 10. He said, Don't assume that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I came. And now here's a prophetic word spoken by Micah hundreds of years before Jesus, and Jesus is fulfilling it right here. He said, For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. The one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross which means to deny yourself and any other way and follow Jesus is not worthy of him. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. And anyone who loses his life for me, because of me, will find it. Jesus came to ruffle feathers. If that bothers you, It bothered a lot of people when he came here to do it, too. They didn't like it, and they put him to death. The key here is to see, as followers of Jesus, if we are really going to follow him and labor for God's kingdom as he taught, then we need to do it his way and live his way. The idea of following Jesus is not only a labor or a task or a duty or a function as a church, but it's a lifestyle. Living the Jesus way, following the Jesus way of life, the, the life that he gives us, the life of the church. When we do that, when we live this way, it leads us to live a fulfilling life together. Author, pastor, Rich Baladas said this, the narrow path Jesus mentions in the Sermon on the Mount is not about the number of people who will end up in heaven. It's about the number of people who will allow themselves to be formed by the submersive and ultimately redemptive way of Jesus. Theologian Dallas Willard said, the gospel is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die and more about how to live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. Living the Jesus way fulfills our deepest human needs for connection, purpose, and joy in this life. Joy is beyond happiness. Living the Jesus way means it's, it is the means by which we attract others in the world to know what life actually should be like by worshiping the one true God with every aspect of our life. This is what God intended. If you follow Jesus, this is what's going to bring you joy, a deep fulfillment of joy. Following Jesus is what's going to make you function better in society. Following Jesus leads you away from self-destructive things. It leads you to treat others with justice 
and as the fellow image bearers of God that you all are. This is not about earning God's favor. Our eternal destiny is rooted in the grace of God. This is about living in his kingdom according to the way he taught us to live. Are we loyal to God and are we showing that relationship to the rest of the world? Are we living according to the Jesus way? I'm going to give you an invitation. To get started living the Jesus way, I'm going to invite you to simply do what he did. Read and apply his Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapters 5 through, 10, uh, 5 through 7. Become a student of Jesus in the way that it is to live in his kingdom. Come to him and confess the way that you have been living. And make a declaration starting right now. You will choose the Jesus way. Let's take a few moments for some self-reflective and confession prayer right now. Just between us and God. Let's do that in silence. I just want to finish by saying, guys, the, the Jesus way is not about a life of perfection. That verse in Philippians 1.6, Paul said, he who began a good work in you will see it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It's not complete until Jesus is here or you are home with Jesus. That means that we're not going to be perfect. As Braden mentioned, that we're going to stumble, we're going to fall, just like Peter did, Jesus' own disciple who was literally with him in person, and he fell. He took his eyes off his master, his king. We do that every day. The point is to continue as students. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a student of your teacher, of Jesus and study him and what he taught so that you know what to do. Not living perfectly, but being made over your lifetime, progressively getting closer and closer to maturity in Christ. So when you fall, don't let that be the last thing that drives you down and spiral. But have it encourage you that, hey, you're not there yet. Neither am I. Neither are everyone else in the church. And that's why we come to church. That's why we're called to gather together here in person to get strengthened because the enemy wants nothing more than to isolate us and strip us away from the community because when we're alone, we are weak. He wants nothing more, as Peter says, the enemy is here to kill, steal, and destroy. But John said, for greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Jesus said that I have overcome the world. That's the confidence that we are supposed to have. All the junk that's in us that plagues our mind, all the times we stumble, it doesn't matter because we have Christ who is victorious over all that. And as long as we continually go back to him, continually seek him as a student of Jesus to live the Jesus way and come together as the church here in person, you get stronger each time you do. That's why we do our friends groups on Monday nights. That's why we do our power prayer hour on Wednesdays. That's why we meet on Sunday mornings and any other time that we have get-togethers. We want to be empowered together, to be students of Jesus together. Don't aim for perfection. Just aim to be a student of Jesus, to live the Jesus way. Good? 
Let's pray, and then we'll sing some songs. Da- Annabelle, you're going to dance for us? Please do. If you feel led to dance, yes, dance. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the life that you gave all of us through your son, Jesus, who, who came here to ruffle feathers, to think outside the box, to live outside the box, to live the Jesus way and model that for us so that we also can live that way in your kingdom. Help us to do that. When we fail, help us to not spiral south. Help us to not get locked in our own head, in our own way, or the way of anything or anyone else, but help us to continue on the narrow path on the way to Jesus, the way of Jesus to the Father. And help us live a life so that when others look at the way we live, They are attracted magnetically to us to want to live that life and have what we have, and we can point them to Jesus. In your name, amen.